Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's We Are Salt and Light Hangout. My name is Jill Rao with the USCCB Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development. Our topic today is on how our faith communities are called to reach out together. Pope Francis writes that any church community, if it thinks it can comfortably go its way without creative concern and effective cooperation in helping the poor to live with dignity and reaching out to everyone, it will also risk breaking down. That's from Joy of the Gospel. So what is reaching out? Reaching out together means asking who and what we don't know, and then reaching out in our families, our faith communities, our neighborhoods, our wider communities. It means encountering those of different cultures, abilities, faith traditions, and experiences. And it means working to develop leaders, including those of diverse ages and ethnicities. So to help us unpack how we're called to reach out together, I'm pleased to introduce three phenomenal panelists. And they're going to be sharing with us some inspiring examples of reaching out together as communities of salt and light. The first person that we'll hear from is Father Alejandro Olayo Mendez. He's a Jesuit priest from the Oregon province in the United States, and he's the initiator of the exciting project for Jesuits in formation that he's going to share with us about today. The second person that we'll hear from is Mary Laver. She's a leader at St. Vincent de Paul Parish in Philadelphia, which is a member of Philadelphians Organized to Witness, Empower, and Rebuild, or POWER. This is a community organization that receives funding from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. And then finally, we'll hear from Greg Wallenbach, who is the Director of Life, Justice, and Peace for the Diocese of Orange in California. And Greg's work there is a model of effective collaboration. So I hope that you'll join me in uh, welcoming our first uh, panelist, Father Alejandro. And go ahead, Father Alejandro. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to, to share this experience with you. Um, I have to say that this project started with a simple conversation in a meeting in Honduras. Uh, we were talking about the need to, for Jesuits to get a closer look at the reality of migration, at the issues involved, at the challenges and the hopes. Uh, so at some point we, uh, in talking, said, well, why don't we create uh, an immersion experience for people to, to get a closer look at this? So this is in some way the, the genesis. So I put together a proposal I submitted to the Jesuit Conference uh, of the U.S. of the Jesuits, and I received a lot of support. So we started the first experience in 2012. Uh, it's a five weeks experience, and at that time I was able to, uh, well, seven Jesuits from different parts of the, the U.S. provinces joined me in the experience. The experience basically is these five weeks in which we go from Central America, go to Mexico, and end up in the United States. We stay at shelters. We, well, in Central America, we look at uh, origin communities, some of the challenges, some of exploring some of the reasons why people have to leave uh, these places. In Mexico, we see a lot of the violence and the uh, journeys that these, especially Central American migrants, have to take. But at the same time, we see what happens with all those Mexicans who have, re have been deported from the U.S. and have to return to their country. So we stay at these shelters that provide humanitarian aid, uh, legal uh, aid, and all these aspects. And then we finish in some way in the U.S. trying to understand what happens to people once they reach the United States what it's at the end of their journeys, if there is in some way an end. Uh, so we ran for the first time this uh, experience in 2012. In 2015, I um, proposed to run it again. The reason, because there's a gap in years, I don't think it's an experience that can be offered every year, but I think every other year is kind of like a, something that is doable. Two reasons, it, it involves a lot of logistics. So when you move people, 3,200 kilometers by bus or trains um, along the, the corridor it involves a lot of logistics. But um, I've been having a lot of support. So this time in 2015, we run the experience again. I have actually six Jesuits with me, four Americans, and I was able to recruit two Mexicans. 
because I truly believe that to understand better the issues surrounding migrations and the challenges, we need to foster collaboration, collaboration between the two countries. Uh, we started um, again in Central America in Guatemala. We moved to the shelters. We stay this time. We stay longer periods of time at the shelters. We visited detention centers. We stay at the border. We went to the courts to see the the, the removal process. We went to, to the forensic when they are identify uh, bodies of migrants that haven't been claimed, and we went to the cemetery also of where is all these people uh, who are never recognized or, or reclaimed are buried. And then we finished in the fields in California. So it was a very moving experience. Again, the, the idea is to understand the phenomenon of migration, understanding these three aspects, origin, transit, return at the same time, and destination. And it's the way to see also and to reflect on opportunities of uh, ministry among migrants and how also not only among migrants but also to collaborate and to see how people rally around an issue and they really live uh, live out the gospel. I think the the last group that I took uh, through the corridor was was really good. We gelled very well, and they I mean they were saying that there was a great um, breadth and depth in the experience. And it was a good opportunity to see the realities in origin, transit, and destination communities. I do believe that since this is uh, one of the priorities of the society in our ministries, this is being at the margins. This is facing the pain, at the same time, the pain of the people, the challenges, but at the same time, hope that these people have for a better life and how you fight for, for to make those things uh, a reality. So I'm. I've been very blessed that I've been um, having the support to run this experience and hopefully I will offer it again in 2017. The provincial just told me that the conference is, is very happy with the experience and that they hope that I will be able to, to offer it again. So depending on how, I, how advanced I, I am with my studies, in do, my doctoral studies, we'll see if I, I'm able to run it again in 2017. Great, thank you so much, Father Father Alejandro. What an inspiring example of of um, these Jesuits in formation responding to Pope Francis's call to encounter and to reach out. Um, participants, if you have questions for our presenters as they're speaking, please chat them in. We're going to be taking questions after they're finished. So, um, so please, if you're participating live, go ahead and, and start chatting in those questions as you listen to our our wonderful panelists. So let's turn to Mary next and tell. Tell us a little bit, Mary, about um, the work in your parish with, with the group Power. And Mary, you're, I think you're muted, so if you can just unmute your microphone, uh, that would be fantastic. How's that? Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm delighted to be here with all of you uh, to talk about our parish and some interesting changes in growth. Uh, this is actually the perfect time because I happen to be not in my office in Philadelphia, but in about uh, 200 yards from the Capitol in Harrisburg because a group of us just were lobbying on behalf of better school funding for our public schools. And also we're a few days from Pentecost and you'll hear in a minute why that's a especially important moment. My parish is a Vincentian parish in the Germantown section of Philadelphia. Historic, beautiful, also challenged. Uh, very uh, once German and Irish, now heavily African American. Uh, St. Catherine Drexel, our native daughter from Philadelphia, helped work with some African American Catholics a century ago or so to build what then felt had to be an exclusively African American church um, parish. And now, actually, after many uh, changes. We are now, St. Vincent's is now the only Catholic church in the Germantown section and we're about 60% white, 40% African American and 100% trying to figure out how to be the one body of Christ. And two ways that we've found this CCHD funded connection with power that Jill mentioned. It's a PICO affiliate founded originally, Father Alejandro, by a Jesuit, Father John Bauman. Give the Jesuits a shout out there. <laughs> years ago and uh, this community organizing model is helping us become one body across races, across economic divides, etc. in two ways and I'll tell you each. 
briefly. One is through this model that actually I first learned when I got to visit my sister parish in El Salvador, but uh, the bishops have translated, this may look familiar to many of you, the two feet of love in action, you can't see it real well on here, but if you go on the USCCB uh, site, you will easily find it, a version done under Pope Benedict and one renewed under uh, Pope Francis, there being charity and service, but also systemic change, social justice. Our parish, St. Vincent's, has been known for decades as stars on that charitable work side, but only when we joined power and began to look at the systemic issues that were new for everyone, old parishioners, new parishioners, African American, white, this was a bonding experience for us because it was new. It's, it felt obvious, but empowering and new to look at the causes, not just how to feed the lineup in front of the soup kitchen, but why is there a lineup here? What's going on in the neighborhood? Why in the, those two public schools that you could throw a child's ball and hit them from the back of our parish, why were they among the two of the dozens that were shut down by the Philadelphia School District a few years ago, displacing thousands of families and, and children in their educational process. So power through our collaboration with other uh, houses of faith across the city, many faiths, uh, Muslim, Jewish, Quaker, Presbyterian, Baptist, you name it, uh, began to look at those causes and that's one reason that I'm sitting here in Harrisburg with a couple of my uh, sisters and brothers in faith sitting in the room patiently uh, because we've just talked with a legislator and posted some some information in, in the Capitol to let them know what an important moral issue this budget issue is for especially the poor children of our state. Um, and that as a, it has really bonded us in our parish and across these congregations. So the second way that a connection to this, P, this CCHD uh, sponsored organizing project has helped us is when Pope Francis set out his itinerary, and I guess, I'm sorry to say, I guess he didn't get to Oregon, or, uh, <laughs> but he got to Philadelphia and the East Coast. And in looking ahead to that, Pico and Power started to write a little curriculum, not uh, just very much an encounter-based, let's read and listen and look carefully at what Pope Francis is saying about people who are excluded, how to encounter them, not just do a study of it and a you know, do a paper on it, but and not a, just a one-shot, oh, we'll do something in Black History Month or Hunger Awareness Week, but how to really build relationships um, around addressing this. So 12 parishes, including mine, got together for the whole last year uh, to discern, listen to witnesses, listen to stories, and each of us picked an issue. For us, it was clear for St. Vincent's, the word that, the, the, although poverty and immigration and criminal justice are big, the real elephant in our living room as people of faith in Germantown is race and racism. So we had a very deep and fragile and uh, uh, tear-filled, really, Lenten time of discerning and listening to some of the elders from Germantown Catholics talking about racism that they had experienced and also some healing, but it really opened up a series of stories that our parish is committed to lifting up new leaders uh, and really uh, not just pushing things into closets, but lifting it up as people of faith. Because clearly, I wish I could say we were alone in dealing with racism, but we know across our country <clears throat> and what we hear in the airwaves, this is so critical for Catholics and for all people of faith to lift up. So, so those are ways that, that we've found this work has really helped us become one body. So... I really appreciate this chance to talk and would welcome any questions. Thank you, Mary, and I think you've probably sparked some ideas in so many other parishes that are that are struggling with similar um, issues in their communities, so thank you for that. Um, finally, we'd like to hear from Greg. So Greg, um, please tell us a little bit about your citizenship campaign that you've been engaged in. Thank you so much, Jill, for the, uh, for the invitation. We have uh, amazing leaders in our parishes, and uh, they don't always know that they're leaders until they are are invited or empowered or or step into these moments where they they lead and and we've we've seen some great great moments. I wanted to share a couple. Just last uh, 
this is back in 2013. Um, we had a large uh, procession uh, having to do with uh, having to do with organizing a, an event around immigration reform and calling for that. And our parish leaders really stepped out in a big way to to come out in in force in the streets of Brea and have a big showing and prayerful a procession to talk about immigration reform. Now. You know that was 2013, right? Like many of us, and now we find ourselves um, asking day to day, you know, well, what can we still be doing? And some some of the, some leaders get you know a little demoralized. What what are we doing in the meantime while we wait for these? Well, we have the executive action in DACA DAPA, and then that got held up in the courts. So so uh, so in the in the spirit of kind of maintaining these connections, we have. Um, worked uh, over the last few years collaborating with our fellow dioceses actually with the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, the Diocese of San Bernardino, um, the Diocese of San Diego has come in this past year as well um, and we've been holding an immigration summit and then this past year was our uh, was our biggest one uh, yet and intentionally so double last year about 500 leaders and we invited leaders from parishes who've been working on these different campaigns around immigration and we came together we shared stories we heard um, from our immigrant sisters and brothers of different statuses mixed status families and to share uh, about that and then we talked about what what are we going to do and and there was a lot of consensus around the idea of moving forward with a citizenship campaign we have hundred and sixty thousand uh, people who are legal permanent residents in Orange County if you take all of Southern California it's 1.2 million people and uh, and so uh, you know as we work on these other fronts of working towards uh, just and compassionate immigration reform uh, trying to work to uh, see uh, relief for for the undocumented brothers and sisters in our mix so we 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 realize that this is something we can actually do right now is invite folks who are uh, legal permanent residents to take that next step and so we launched this campaign essentially what we're doing is is uh, doing forums at churches, doing uh, promotional materials, inviting leaders, inviting parishes into this work of, of saying wherever you are on your immigrant journey, the church is here uh, to accompany you and to walk with you. In the spirit of, of Francis's invitation to encounter and, and uh, accompaniment, we really want to, as churches and as church leaders, be present, uh, walking alongside people. So although right now it's focused around citizenship, we're also continuing to do uh, working with our, our Catholic charities, respective Catholic charities and our, and our dioceses um, to invite people into continuing to apply for DACA and other services. But the amazing thing about this work has been the spiritual side of it. And I wanted to share about this in terms of leadership development. At our, at our forums, um, we always take time to have a have a, a short reflection, a reading of Jesus' own family migration story as his the Holy Family went down to Egypt. And then we have people break into groups, one on one to one or small groups, to talk about their reflection on that scripture. And then we have them share very briefly, but we have them share a little bit of their own immigration story. Uh, with each other, whether they immigrated recently, whether their family immigrated generations earlier, they have a chance to begin to share those stories, and that's been really one of the most powerful aspects of this. And we've seen this up in our events, up in the Archdiocese of LA has had here in the Diocese of Orange, out in San Bernardino, people who've worked um, side by side, ministered side by side with each other, sometimes for years, who've never shared the story of how they arrived in this country what it was like when they got here, what their first job was, what that experience was like, intercultural uh, differences between different different stories, different communities. So that's been a really beautiful aspect of this process. And just a couple quick stories about the impact. You know, we've had, I was at a meeting sharing inviting youth ministers to engage in this project. And, you know, one of the youth ministers raised their hand when I mentioned legal permanent residence. And he said, that's me. Actually, that reminds me, I need to become a citizen. And he pops up. And a, another meeting at a deanery meeting with priests, we had a priest who afterwards pulled me aside and asked for my card and said, you know, actually, I'm, I'm not a citizen yet either. And this really reminded me that I need to be, I, I need to take that next step. And so we've heard from people across the spectrum, uh, including going to a uh, an event at the uh, Renovación Carismática just this past weekend, um, to a, a large event with uh, uh, in 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 the community to uh, to look at. Um, I'm going to find the picture here of that one. Um, basically, a large a large gathering of apostolic movements, going and connecting with different movements within the church to meet and to talk and just share information with people. And we had people coming up for, for two to three hours nonstop along with Catholic Charities sharing these stories and, and trying to consistently ask the question, um, what, uh, what, what, are the, uh, what are the barriers? In, in a sense, why has it taken 
uh, to this point and so hearing all those stories and so there's just a couple pictures here from the citizenships forums that we've had um, but I wanted to really encourage people to to continue to engage in this in this journey of accompaniment and walking alongside and and figuring out what is it that can be done in front of us and continuing to do that um, even as we continue to work to protect rights and 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 walk along with undocumented work for reform what are the pieces that we can do and how can we collaborate together and I'll I'll stop there and maybe we can come back to questions later thank you great thank you so much Greg for yet another inspiring example of, of trying to really foster that encounter um, empower people of, of all different um, ethnicities to to really live out that call to mission as the body of Christ so I have a um, I invite the uh, the audience to continue um, submitting their questions but um, uh, Mary some questions for you um, an easy one and a hard one the easy one is um, if if our parish wants to participate in the Pope Francis um, uh, encounter program that you mentioned how can we do so um, and then also how how um, might a parish that experiences um, racism um, begin to talk about that what's a good first step Wow good questions well the answer to the first one uh, as far as little reflection groups go you can go to the uh, Pico National Network I would just Google it PICO National Network www first and you'll see a, a website and you can go under programs and one of them listed they have quite a few about immigration uh, and about mass incarceration but one is about Pope Francis you'll find it on there if you have trouble uh, you can also Google uh, year of encounter with Pope Francis and it will come up um, what we found is that the, the talking and reading and praying part is great, but we know we can all sort of feel both Jesus and the Holy Spirit and, and Pope Francis over our shoulder. It's got to take form. So we went beyond the study sessions to really say, what are we called to do? And so I would just encourage you to go from there to doing. And when your second question about what uh, how what was it exactly, Jill? How to get involved in yeah, for a parish that it also has experiences of, of racism? What's a, a good first step to start talking right. about that? Well, universally, what we have found is uh, relationships. If there's a single simple thing, and we have heard sad stories that I almost can't believe of people reaching out, an African American reaching out during the Kiss of Peace, and certain people who are white not shaking their hand. I can't believe this happens in churches, but human beings are human beings. And so uh, we have found that setting up, making an effort to reach out, create social environments that don't just assume that everybody has email. Uh, that's often a class difference, which can correlate with a race difference. Consciously bringing people to into committee structures of both races or all races. And again, we have found that community organizing has been especially good because the idea is leadership empowerment and lifting up stories of pain in order to gain insight and move on a, a move from there into action which there's nothing like working together uh, that as we know from uh, if you have kids in school you become close and bonded with the other parents working together on a project uh, just bonds people that together with prayer is terrific if you can go on a parish retreat even better so okay. thank great, you great. Thank so you much. Um, um, thank you. Question for you. Um, what impact do you think that the ex this uh, experience of encountering and reaching out is having on the Jesuits in formation? How do you hope that this experience will affect their ministry? Well, I think that when you work on um, on issues like immigration, you need to create collaboration. You need to create and foster and develop a network. I told this to the Jesuit conference. It is not my expectation that everybody that goes through the uh, experience will end up ministering to migrants. But they will end up ministering in other settings that where they will have the opportunity to educate other people about these issues. Where they will ha and they will have a first hand experience, like face to face. They have heard the stories. They have seen the realities. They have seen, I mean, like all the process, all the dynamics that are involved in the process. 
of moving from one country to another one, and they will carry that with them. So my hope is that the experience will have it's the experience is designed in a way that has it has enough information, enough experience, and of course the experience in itself itself provides depth for them to carry on forward and wherever they minister, even if it's in a high school, in a university, at a parish, they will carry that knowledge with them and they will be able, able to educate people, to relate to people, and uh, to share this experience that they have seen face to face. Great, thank you. And I apologize, we're not going to have time to take any of the other questions. However, in the last two minutes before we end, um, what I do want to make sure everyone's aware of is um, the WeAreSaltAndLight.org website, which I'm going to attempt to share right now, um, which really speaks to a lot of the issues that um, and experiences that many of our panelists have brought up. Um, if you go to the to the website, you'll see that Reach Out Together is one of the four steps in a pastoral process that's laid out here. When you visit that section, you can find all sorts of resources for uh, the type of work that you've just heard about. Um, how do you build relationships and create a culture of encounter through one-to-ones? Um, you know, how do you dialogue about different issues? How, how do you um, engage in um, developing leaders from diverse communities from, of diverse ages? Um, how do you appreciate the ethnicities and cultures of all who are, who are worshiping together um, or being your faith community together? How do you reach out in the community? How do you work with people of other faiths? So there's a, a bunch of really fan fantastic resources at the wearesaltandlight.org website about reaching out together. Um, second, you may be interested in checking out some of the success stories. There's over 65 stories listed, um, shown on this website about how communities are praying, reaching out, learning, and acting together. Um, here's a few that are about the experience of reaching out, um, similar to those that you've heard today on this Hangout. And then finally, um, if reaching out together is something that your community is trying to work on, you may be interested in this assessment tool. Um, you can visit any of the four uh, parts of the pastoral cycle and you can um, answer questions about um, how you're doing in, in different aspects of reaching out together. And when you get to the end of that survey, which I won't um, do all of the questions right now, you will find um, suggestions and recommendations for how you can reach out together better. So I just want to um, take a moment to thank our, our fantastic panelists and um, Thank everyone for participating in the Hangout. We will be having additional Hangouts on uh, Learn Together and Act Together. Those will happen in the fall. Um, this has been recorded, and we will make it available publicly afterwards as well. So thank you so much to our fantastic panelists and for all of you who participated. And have a wonderful day.